just a few minutes ago. But we begin a new series, and uh, our text is here, where he said in verse uh, chapter 9, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, he says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he's dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Father, we pray about this service, this message, this ministry this evening. Uh, we come together agreeing as touching this and asking you for utterance, for light of truth that makes free. We're asking you for answers to questions, direction, uh, a supply of the Spirit for the anointing and moving of your Spirit and manifesting of the gifts of your Spirit and the moving and manifesting of your holy angels, your holy power, to uh, reveal and make known and, and make real and, and clear and accomplish in us, to us, through us, your perfect will, your, pl your perfect plan, that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask it in Jesus' name. We believe we receive it. Amen. 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 You believe in with me? Thank you. We begin last time I spoke, what was it, two weeks ago, on this series we're calling Abounding Ability. Abounding Ability. And our text here says that God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you, you always have all sufficiency. He's able to make grace abound towards you. How many like the sound of grace abounding towards you? Hmm, that sound good? What's the result of grace abounding towards you? According to this verse, what's the result of grace abounding towards you? You always, how often is always? That's every day, that's every night. That's every week of the year. Is that right? Yes. That's every year of your life. Always having all sufficiency. How much is all sufficiency? <laughs> if even one area was short, you wouldn't have all sufficiency. All sufficiency in all things are all areas. How many are all areas? Are all things. If even one area was deficient in short, that wouldn't be all areas, wouldn't be all things. And this, the result of you always having all sufficiency in all things or areas is that you can abound. Well, the grace abounded towards you and that puts you in ability to, in ability to abound toward every good work. Keep reading. As it is written, he's dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor. Given what? Dispersed what? <laughs> Here's a very simple truth that millions of tradition-minded Christians have let escape them. It's real ignorance to fight prosperity. Hmm? We've had probably as much persecution from teaching on abundance and so-called prosperity as any other thing. Healing and miracles would be a close second. But we've had people write letters and emails and I've had folks tell me in person, call me everything but a nice fellow for preaching on these things. We've had a lot of persecution about that. And yet, some of these same folks would turn around and say, you should do things for the poor. With what? 
You don't believe you're supposed to have anything. But you're supposed to do for people. That doesn't work. Come on, are y'all with me? You can't give what you don't have. Can you? You can't do for people. You can't do for folks in need. You can't do for the work of the gospel with what you don't have. Can you? And so it's, it's a trick of the enemy that people have revered poverty and, and attached it to holiness. Really? Really? It's true. I mean, people all over the place. I mean, there are people that preach that the, the holier you get, the less stuff you will have. And if you really are close to God and holy, then you basically take a vow of poverty. And you vow not to have anything or own anything. But who does that help? Me being broke, how would that help you? <laughs> you being broke, how does that help others? Hmm? If More Life Ministries was a broke ministry, there wouldn't be a Branson church. The partners of More Life Ministries, the Lord poured millions of dollars to get that church started and going. And if Branson was a broke church, <laughs> and More Life Ministries was a broke ministry, there wouldn't be a Sarasota church. Hmm? Having, a, having more than we needed to run Branson Church, having more than we needed to run More Life Ministries enabled us come on is somebody listening to reach out and do some significant things for somebody else somewhere else like you having more than we needed to have a service there in Branson years ago enabled us to buy TV equipment and internet equipment and, and to pay for whatever it took for however, how many thousands or millions of folks wanted to download these things. It enabled us to sow outside of ourselves. Amen. And this is nothing but love for God and love for people. Come on, can you say amen? amen. And when you see this, it begins to stir in you a hunger and a desire not just to accumulate a bunch of stuff for yourself but to have abounding ability. Yes. Come on, are you listening? Yes. To do beyond yourself. Yes. And it's got to be a whole lot more than just what you need. Yes. A lot of folks have fought this. Because of deception, because of ignorance, because of laziness, it's a whole lot easier to just believe for your electric bill and your groceries and your hobby and be happy and live your life and go fishing or play golf. <laughs> but there's more to it than that. You and I, every believer is capable of so much more. Hmm? And we ought not be lazy. And the thing is, if all you do is only take care of yours, even if you get every little thing you thought you wanted and to do, you will still not be fulfilled. You will not be satisfied. Come on, are you listening? You will not be because you're made for more. You're made for bigger. You will only be happy. You will only be fulfilled and satisfied when God is meeting needs beyond yours through you. You believe it, saints? But it doesn't just fall on you. It takes faith 
You have to go after it. You have to preach it. You have to hear it. You have to believe it. I'm talking about as a church. You know, I had a fellow come one time and wanted to take me to task about, he said, well, we don't believe in that healing stuff and that miracle stuff. He said, uh, we, uh, we, don't, we don't believe that. We'd, I've never seen anything like that, they said. I said, well, do your, your preachers and your church preach it? They said, oh, no, we don't believe in it. And I said, and you don't have it? They said, no. <laughs> I said, wonder if there's a connection here. <laughs> we preach it. And I pointed to, we, we had a shelf over there where the, the office where I was, and it was full of binders like that big of testimonies of miracles. I said, we preach it, and we have it. Don't you, you hear testimonies all the time, don't you? I mean, the Phyllis and different ones share them. Things are happening. Faith comes by what? What if you never hear about it? And I said, we preach it, and we have it. Y'all don't preach it, and you don't have it. Wonder if there's any connection. Jesus said, these signs will follow those that never hear about it. No, them that believe. When people say, well, I don't believe in it. Well, you won't be bothered with it. <laughs> you won't be bothered with it. And that's a shame if you're not bothered with healings. And miracles. Isn't it? That's bad. And I, knew, I noticed after, I think it was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years of being in the healing school there at Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry, preaching on healing every day, every day, sometimes two or three times a day, every day. And I noticed that I had enjoyed robust health. For years, I mean, I'd go years and not even a sniffle. And I, I mean, and, and then I thought, and then I had a revelation. I thought, man, you need to preach on money more. You need to preach on prosperity because my prosperity wasn't there. And that's, that's not just a funny, it's a truth. Even though your faith might be strong in one area, that doesn't make it strong in all areas. And if you don't hear the word in that area, your faith's not going to be strong in that area. Faith comes how? By hearing. by hearing. And faith for that comes by hearing the word on that. For that. And so we did. We began to, to, to meditate more on it and preach more on it and teach more on it. And thank God we did begin to come up. And we're going to continue some more. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Anybody coming up? Yeah. Will it just fall on you? No. no. Will it fall on you if you don't believe in it? No, it'll stay away from you. <laughs> hmm? do you. Do you have a part to play in it? Yes, yes you do. Yes, you do. You need to hear about these things. Now, uh, those of you especially new, well, new with us anywhere, new in Branson, new here, new on the internet, uh, you, you see how time passes and a lot of things are going and uh, uh, we're, we're ministering generally to everybody. And uh, you can't talk on the same subject all the time, but there is, there's a lot of things that have already been taught and ministered on the internet. Entire series, you know, 10 sessions, 15 sessions, 20 sessions, 30 sessions. Come on, are y'all listening? And, and, and if you need to be fed in these areas, not just from uh, our ministry only, but find things that feed your spirit. And appeal to and, and, and feed on them. Get in there and get it. And of course with these, with our stuff, it won't cost you a penny. Just download it or get, ask for the CDs or DVDs. Feed your faith. Feed your faith. If you're deficient in that area, feed your faith. You know how you, you can tell when you're getting full of faith? It'll start kicking out of your mouth. <laughs> Did you know you could tell when your car is full of gas? Even if you didn't have a gauge. Could you tell? What do you do? You stick that nozzle in there and you just keep pumping and pumping and pumping. And you say, well, I wonder if it's full. You don't have to wonder. Just keep pumping. Right? Wonder if it's full yet. Surely it's got to be close to full. You don't have to wonder. Just keep pumping. Right? And after a while, what's going to happen? It's going to kick back out the mouth. Right? Well, you just stick the nozzle of the word in that area. Come on, are you listening? In your ear. 
and you just keep pumping it and pumping it and pumping it day after day, night after night, how can you tell when you get full, when, you, when your faith gets there? It'll start kicking out of your mouth. You'll start saying it without even trying to think about it or mean to, and that's when you know you're getting somewhere. You actually believe it in your heart now, and you're saying it with your mouth. It'll begin to come to pass in your life. That doesn't necessarily happen in a day or two or because you heard two messages, <laughs> right? You got you to feed your faith until, as long as it takes. Now, um, he said, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. We saw in John 10.10 10, that Jesus said, the thief doesn't come but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it what? How? He could have just said that you might have life, period, and that would have been wonderful. But he, he, he describes and defines life that he came to give us. It's not just a eek by, squeak by life, is it? Scrape the bottom life. What kind of life is it? The Amplified says it like this, and, and it amplifies the, uh, the Greek word. I came that they might have and enjoy life. Have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Which is an amplification of the English to correctly uh, describe the Greek. We looked up these words last time. And there's about, let's see, uh, about seven different words that come from the same root word that are translated abundance, abounding, and every kind of form of that in the same New Testament. And uh, it's from this word parasos. I don't know if I pronounced it right or not. But it's, uh, you look it up in your Strong's, look it up in your... Uh, vines and thayers, brown, different ones. And it literally means super abundance. Now you have to put the super on there or it doesn't describe what the word is saying. Abundance is more than enough. But this is more than that. <laughs> Which is why the Amplified says, to the full and then till it overflows. To the full would be abundance. Mm -hmm. Till it overflows is more than that. Amen. Right? Yes, so you could say it like this. Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy life and have it super abundantly. Another definition of that is surplusage. That's a nice word, isn't it? Yeah. Say it out loud. Surplusage. Say that fast real seven times. <laughs> surplusage. What is surplusage? Well, that would be the state of surplus. Right? What is surplus? Uh, another word is excess. Excess. In the sense of beyond, one definition says. One says excessive. You, you see the words superfluous in the scripture, in the New Testament, in the King James. All these are relative degrees of enough and then some. <laughs> enough and more. In fact, this is how it's translated in John 6. We saw it. That which remained over and above. That was when they had the 12 baskets and the five barley loaves. Did they have plenty to eat? Amen. Hmm? Amen. No, they had more than that. Right? Everybody's felt bellies full and they got 12 baskets left over. It was uh, enough and to spare. Enough and more. Over and above. We use that phrase all the time nowadays. Over and above. Right? That's the kind of life the Lord came to give us. Is the over and above life. Are we believing for that? Most folks are not. Truth is, most folks are not. All the more reason why we should. 
right? Somebody needs to, especially with not everybody doing it. It's, it's critical, you might say, that some folk do it, and some people are going to need to do it a little more than average, right? To make up for the ones that's not. Hmm? And people can mock us and make fun if they want to, but uh, it won't bother us at all when we're in a position to do something that makes a difference, right? And they're not. Well, I won't say that. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, go with me to the book of James. You said you're believing with me this evening? Stay hooked. Now, in order to experience this abundance that the Lord is talking about, our motives must be right. Our heart must be right. And you're believing with me, you said, right? You're believing with me. There's uh, several decades ago, not hardly anybody was talking about abundance or plenty. But in the last, you know, 20 years especially, 30 years, uh, there's a lot of folks, Christians, that have become aware that God would bless you and, and meet your needs, and it's growing. Not that it's anywhere like it needs to be, because you still got millions of Christians that revere poverty, and that's just deception. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, good about poverty, or sickness, or disease, or death. Death is an enemy. I've heard preachers stand by a casket and say God took our dear brother in sweet death. That's crazy talk. He received them if they're believers and they're coming to him is precious. But death is not sweet. It's an enemy. It's decay. Come on, are you listening, saints? Sickness can be an occasion for God to be glorified in people getting healed. Just like sin can be an occasion for God to be glorified when people are saved and delivered from it. Poverty can be an occasion. Do you hear the word, friend? An occasion for God to be glorified when people's needs are met out of it. But poverty never glorified God. I know it's strong talk. Let me say it louder. <laughs> Disease does not glorify God. It can't. It's not a work of God. It's a work of the devil. It's stealing. It's killing and destroying. It can be an occasion for God to be glorified, but he's not glorified in the decay. He's not glorified. Now think about poverty. There are people who died today on the planet for lack of a decent meal to eat. That's poverty. There are people who went cold today for lack of enough money to have their heat on. They didn't die, but it's the same evil stuff. Come on, can you see it? Whether you got a little bit of it in your life or whether you got so much of it that you die. It's evil. I said it's evil and you need to be opposed to it and not give it any place in your life. It is not okay. Poverty is not of God. Never has been. Religious men have developed all these ideas and doctrines that it helped develop your piety. Let me say, well, Jesus, you know, Jesus was poor. We're supposed to be like Jesus. <laughs> really? You need to examine every one of those phrases. How poor was he? Well, as soon as he came on the scene, rich people brought gold to his house. 
Is that right? They had enough money in ministry, they had to have a treasurer. And he, had, he carried enough money that he could uh, embezzle and it not be noticed. If you only got $3, First of all, you don't need a treasure, right? <laughs> Secondly, if somebody takes one of them, everybody's going to know, yeah. right? <laughs> Jesus and his disciples, their ministry, you, you could call it, they had enough to give to the poor on a regular basis. When you are the poor, you don't have the ability, Right? You're looking for help. But it is true that he didn't own properties. And uh, he, he's here for a very short time. If you say, well, I'm going to be just like Jesus. Well, then also you're never going to travel outside your home area. And neither are you going to get married or have any kids. And neither are you going to own anything at all. And you'll die before age 35. How much are you going to be like Jesus? Now, these are all things we've gotten into in detail in, in subjects like Prosperity Proven and Good News for the Poor, whole series that I've mentioned to you before. I don't have time to get into all that right now, but don't just take my word in it. If something rubs you the wrong way, don't just get uh, irritated with me. Prove me wrong from the Bible. Get those, get those CDs, get those downloads and go through and go through everything we went through and prove me wrong with scriptures. If I'm wrong, I want to know. I'm serious. I want to find out. But I could care less about what you think. I said scriptures. Scriptures. Y'all with me, saints? No. You're right here. You were. You're in James now, aren't you? Well, you should have stayed in 2 Corinthians. <laughs> you can go back, can't you? Actually, go to uh, 1 Corinthians. Thanks be unto God. Uh, let's see. I, I told you right the first time. Um, 2 Corinthians. I got excited. <laughs> we saw the 8th chapter. There, I mean the the eighth verse in the ninth chapter. In the eighth chapter, just right before that, in the ninth verse, that was nine eight. This is 8, 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was what? Rich. He was rich. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. Hmm? So we'll see there, Jesus became poor, and so I should be poor. No, you need to read a little bit further. Right? He was rich. And he became poor that you might be poor. Huh? Jesus was poor, so you should be poor. Huh? No, much, most of the church world believes this. Jesus was poor, so you should be like Jesus. <laughs> See, that, that's, I mean, when somebody says you should be like Jesus, everybody goes, they just start nodding their head. Yeah. Well, actually, it depends on what you're talking about. Huh? There are some things he did as our example, and we should follow his example. There are other things he did as our substitute. He did it in our place so that we wouldn't have to be like that. He became sin, not so we could sin. He took our unrighteousness, not so we could stay unrighteous. He took the chastisement of our peace, not so we could continue to be frustrated and worried and scared. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains, not so we could stay sick. 
Come on, saints, do you believe it? Is this just as true as those other redemptive verses? You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did you notice that this is just a few verses before we re- our text that we read? All this flows together. Why would you and I have a right to have abundance, to always have all sufficiency in every area and abundance to give because of this right here? This is what bought us that right. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Why? Why? (laughs) That you, through him becoming poor, through his poverty might be rich. Do you believe it? Did he do it? Did he obtain this for us? Then you got a right to be rich. (laughs) Save your letters. I already got them. (laughs) I'm reading scriptures. If you're in Christ, you have a right, not because of what you've done, because of what he's done, you got a right to be righteous. You got a right to be clean. You got a right to be healed. And you got a right to be rich. I didn't write this. (laughs) I had a fellow meet me out in the parking lot one time after I preached. Man, he was so bad. I'm telling you, he's standing there with his fist balled up. I thought he was going to take a swing at me. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do if he did. I I decided I'd step back real quick. (laughs) You know, you don't want to see on the front page the next day, pastor beats up parishioner. You just don't. You don't want to see that. Uh, and, I, and he said, he said, it's not right. It's not right. I don't like it. I said, what? He said, you keep talking about being rich, being rich. That's not right. That's not right. I said, which verse didn't you like? <laughs> this is in a verse. Come on. Are y'all looking at the word or not? Huh? Eight, nine. The last word is what? R I C H. This was in here before I was born, before my daddy was born, before my grandpa was born. Come on. I did not put that in there. If the Lord didn't like that word, he shouldn't have put that in there. But I reckon he likes it just fine because that's the one he used. (laughs) He could have used a different word, couldn't he? This is his word, his choice. It's what he said. He said, I, he said, rich, rich, I can't, I can't stand to hear that. I said, that, it's a Bible word, brother. He said, it's not right. I said, it's, it's a scripture. <laughs> but now think about this. Why would anybody get worked up like that over? There's plenty of other things they're not worked up over. <laughs> Why get worked up? Because the devil tries so hard to keep the church out of this. Why? Because what if the global church was rich what if (laughs) what if then there wouldn't be hindrances and limitations to us getting the job done of preaching this gospel all over the world (laughs) you can almost hear some folks thinking right now Well, I don't like it. Well, I know you don't, but why don't you like it? Hmm? Why? The thing that should carry the most weight in your life is right here. Right? Right here. Jesus became poor. So that what? So that we could stay poor. Are you sure? Huh? Come on, read it. Read it. Make sure I'm reading it right. Help me out. 
You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, not for his own, he didn't need to do this for himself, he was already rich. For your sakes, did we need some help in the rich department? Ha ha ha, yeah. And for our sakes, he became poor. How many of this is, this is redemptive language? He became sin with our sin, not so we could live in sin. Right? He took our infirmities, he bore our sicknesses, he carried our pains, not so we could stay sick all our life. Right? The chastisement of our peace was on him. Not so we could be worried and frustrated and fearful. So we could be free from these things. He took our place. He took that in him. He bore the price and paid the price for it. That you through his poverty might be rich. And if you're honest and you read the rest of this 8th chapter and this ninth chapter that our text came from, you'll realize he is talking primarily about material things. He's talking about offerings, money, and things. Now sure, it's, it's bigger than that. It includes more than that. But right here, he's talking about that. Now go to James. There still needs to be a lot of preaching and teaching on this because faith comes by hearing. And we, our minds need to be renewed so that we think right. And we're not opposing the very blessing we got to have to get our job done. But on the other hand, there are some folks that, have, that, that preach prosperity in a wrong way. And the emphasis is wrong. And the focus is wrong. And the purpose is wrong. And the Bible also talks about that. And we're going to talk about it some tonight. Is that okay with you? Amen. In uh, James, the fourth chapter, how many know the, the, the scripture says the word should be rightly divided? What does that mean? Rightly divided. That doesn't mean compromised. How do you rightly divide scripture with other scripture? That's how you do it. Uh, a scripture cannot disagree with another scripture. That the word is right and the word agrees. If it seems to disagree, there's nothing wrong with the word, never has been. There's something wrong with your understanding of it. It's amazing how prideful people are when they go, see, those verses don't even agree. No, you just found out something you don't understand. <laughs> They've always agreed. <laughs> they agree perfectly. You just don't see it. How many know it's very haughty? You've been alive about that long. God's been around forever. <laughs> right? And you decide, no, I've examined that and it is not in agreement. There's something wrong with these verses. Really? <laughs> That's your conclusion. There couldn't be anything wrong with your perception or your understanding. It has to be something wrong with this book. No, all the word agrees. In uh, James, the fourth chapter, James 4 and verse 1, he says, From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence from here, even of your lusts, that war in your members. Now, the word lust just simply means strong desire. And it can be a strong desire for a whole bunch of different things. But he said your, your fightings and your warrings come from your desires that war in your members. Verse 2, you lust. What does lust mean? When you hear lust in the King James, you ought not automatically think sex. That's wrong thinking. Now I know in our vernacular, it, it ties in with that more strongly than anything else, but in the Bible it does not. It could include that. But it, it, you, could be, you could be lusting after money. You could be lusting after a thing or a house or, a, you know, 
It just simply means a strong desire. It means a longing for. And it can mean all kind of different things that you're actually longing for. He said, you, you lust, you have not, you kill. And desire to have and cannot obtain. People are willing to kill to get what they want. And they are. You fight and you war. Is that the way children of God are supposed to try to get what they want? No. no. See, this has to do with take. Why would you have to fight? Because they don't want to give you what you're trying to get. So you've decided what? You're going to take it away from them. So they're fighting you to keep you from taking it away. Or you're fighting them to keep them from taking it away. And again and again, when a war develops, people can say it's over this or over that, but that's what it's over. Somebody's got something that somebody else wants. And they come to take it away from them. And if they're fighting, that means they're not just going to let them come take it away without a fight. You fight and war, yet you have not. Why? Is there another way to get some? Besides fighting and trying to take it from somebody else. It is. Asking God. Of course, if you don't believe in God, you're back to your first choice. So people that don't believe in God, where are you going to get what you want? If you don't believe in God, that doesn't leave anybody else except us. You have not, why? Because you didn't ask. You didn't go to God. You didn't ask Him for it. You're not looking to Him as your source. But verse 3 uh, sheds further light. You ask and what? Receive not. You did ask. But you didn't get it. Why? Because you asked amiss. Everybody say ask amiss. Ask amiss. You, you, we could say it like this. You missed it in the way you asked for it. And the particular place you missed it is that you may consume it upon your lusts. Now let me read the NIV on this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Don't, uh, don't underestimate the desire for things. And money. People like to act like, oh, I don't care about all that stuff. And most of the time when people tell you that, they are lying. Yeah. It's a big deal. How many have found out, live long enough in this world to find out, money is a deal? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. It's a very big deal. A lot of times the people that holler the loudest that they don't care about it <laughs> are the ones you got to watch. Because <laughs> they're working something. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? There's something battling within them. You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Keep going. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. How many think we need to know what these wrong motives are? Yeah. Don't we? Yeah. We know the Lord wants us blessed. We got, got through talking about it. We know provision has been made in Christ for us to be rich in every good thing. For us to abound. And yet, your heart matters, doesn't it? And your motives matter. And it's possible to ask and try to get and not receive because your heart's not right. Your motives are not right. Should we talk about this? Yeah. We should. We need to. 
When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The Living Bible says it like this. Even when you do ask, you don't get it. This is the Living Bible. Because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. The Bible speaks about in uh, 2 Timothy. You don't have to turn there. They'll put it up for us. 2 Timothy 3 and 1. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 says, This know also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Traitor, heady, verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of what? Pleasures more than lovers of God. This is the problem. These two words right here, more than. Now we know God's will is for us to have more than. More than enough. More than more than enough. But in order to qualify for the more than enough, you got to love God more than. Are y'all with me, saints? If you love the stuff more than Him, you'll be asking amiss. Did you hear me, saints? And that's, this is a reason he said you ask and didn't get. So these are people that asked God, but they didn't get things that they asked. Because their motives weren't right. We know the Lord wants us to have everything we need. For what? To serve him. He wants us to have super abundance for what? He is not obligated to finance people's rebellious lifestyles. <laughs> is he? No. He's not obligated to underwrite you doing your own thing. What happens in those cases is you wind up on your own. The best you can do what you can produce. But when it comes to doing His will and pleasing Him, you have a right to surplusage. Hmm? Do you believe it, saints? Does it make any difference what our, where our heart is? Didn't Jesus say where your treasure is? That's where your heart is. Uh, I've, uh, like a lot of people, I've always enjoyed uh, cars and uh, sports cars. And as country folks growing up over in Mississippi, uh, my, my parents and, and uh, my uncles and aunts, you know, folks in the 40s and 50s, um, their, one of their biggest pastimes was ripping up and down the road in a car, especially in the South. I think it's true of most of the country. And so, man, my, uh, my dad, my uncles, and my grandpa, and, I mean, my dad taught me how to squeak the tires in second gear when I was barely big enough to look over the dash. I mean, I, you know, we built motors and transmissions, and, and as a kid, you know, I, I worked jobs when I was 12 and 13 and, and all the way through high school so I could have money to buy parts, <laughs> you know, and, and, and get my ride where it needed to be. And, and uh, it's a big deal. So I've always enjoyed something that was loud and fast. And uh, when Phyllis and I got into the ministry, I left my stuff. I felt like I needed to. I, I, I had a 37 Ford Coupe that I was in the process of rebuilding. I, I walked away and left it, eventually sold it for parts. I, I walked away from, I left my motorcycle. I left some stuff that I, I knew it meant too much to me. I needed to 
get it out of my system. I'm not taking a vow that I'll never have it again, but I know it has taken too much of my time and too much of my thoughts and too much of my money. Come on, are y'all listening to me? Did you know what covetousness is? Uh, in, in Colossians, they'll put it up on the screen for us. In Colossians, I believe it's the third chapter. Let me see. The, the, uh, let's see, the uh, fifth verse or so. Colossians 3, 5, put that up for us. He said, mortify your members. What does mortify mean? Put it to death. Kill it. Are there some things in your life and about you that need to be killed? So I said, boy, it hurts me not to do it. Well, we need to go further and just go ahead and kill it (laughs) on some of these things. It needs to be put to death. Why? Because it means too much to you. Which are on earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness. Covetousness is what? Which is idolatry. Say it out loud. Covetousness Covetousness. is Is. idolatry. Idolatry. What is idolatry? Well, you know, the Israelites made a golden calf. You remember that? Fell down and worshipped it and said, this is your God. And That's one of the first commandments that the Lord said, you have no other gods before me. You don't have any idols. You don't make any statues or likeness of God. Why? Because the whole world around them and still much of the world today prays to rocks and statues and pictures and it has absolutely got nothing to do with God. Amen. He commanded that you don't do it. And uh, worshiping something that's not God, he said covetousness is that. Are there people who worship and reverence and think more and talk more about stuff than they do God? No question. Is that okay with God? It is not okay. Are they going to abound and prosper in the will of God, uh, you know, putting things ahead of him? You're not. And that's why, in fact, sometimes they're desperate and asking for this thing that they want in that area, but they're not going to get it from him. Are you listening? Because it's got nothing to do with his plan for their life. And they really want that more than they want him. And more than they want his will and his plan. And it's not okay. It's not okay. So as I was telling you, we we left our little home there in Mississippi. I left my hot rods there. I left my motorcycle there. Uh, Phyllis left stuff there. And we just, we went to uh, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And Kenneth Hagin Ministries and Rainbow Bible Training Center. There for years, I, I wound up with a little pickup truck that I drove, and it wasn't very powerful either. <laughs> Not a real pretty color either, and, but that's okay. That's okay. It got me from point A to point B, and, and we did that, and we, we actually wound up with, a, with an old uh, Oldsmobile, big old four-door, wasn't very pretty, and, and some other things, and, and, but, but hey, this is not our priority. Are y'all with me, saints? Years passed. Years passed. And uh, we were were able to get a new sports car. I got a new Corvette. Brand new. Always had wanted one. And I got it. And, you know, I was taught to take care of your stuff. And and so, man, you know, it, it rarely got dirty. And if it did, I washed it immediately. And, you know, it was, it, it was pretty spotless. And, and uh, I was out there one Saturday uh, into my third hour uh, detailing it. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me. <laughs> I don't mean I heard a voice out here, but he'll speak to any child of God if you learn how to listen. He's, is he on the inside or not? Yes. Well, if he said something, why couldn't you hear it if he's right there? I mean, you're right there and I could hear you. If you're inside, you certainly ought to be able to hear. I'm not talking about hearing voices outside. I'm talking about inside. And he said to me, he said, son, if you don't quit spending so much time on this thing, I'm going to regret I'll let you have it. I dropped the rag. 
<laughs> he said, I've called you to do other things. You're to emphasize other things. I'll give you help on some of these things. Don't, th th this thing should, ha should have a very, now I'm not, I, I, he's not saying all this to me. I got all these things just when he said that one phrase to me. Um, this thing should be way down on the list of what's important to me and what's priority in my time. It's not, is it okay or is it his will for you to have it or not? That's not it's, it's not as cut and dried as that. It depends on how much it means to you. Are y'all with me, saints? And that varies from person to person. So getting back to this, this passage here, this text, he tells us we need to mortify things and realize that a covetousness is idolatry. Say that out loud. Covetousness is idolatry. So praying to a statue of a false goddess or a dragon god or a whatever god, would, would it be okay to do that a little bit for a Christian? You don't do it all the time. Huh? <laughs> So, so how much covetousness is it okay for us to have? Because it is idolatry, right? Yes. And anything can be an idol to you. To some people, it's their house. Hmm? Yeah. They, they can't even relax. They can't even rest unless it's a certain way. And nobody else can touch this or that or use this. Some people, it's their clothes, it's their jewelry, it's their vehicles, it's their this or that. But the truth is, soon and very soon, it's going to be ashes. Did you read your chapter today? Hmm? Anybody read your chapter today, yesterday and today? What's about to happen to everything down here? It's all burning. It's all melting. Every bit of it. So I don't care if it's a $10 million house. It's ashes in a few days. Right? I don't care if it's a million dollar car. Ashes in a few days. Is that right? And everything down here is like a gallon of milk. It's got a date on it, right? And it's only good for a little while. How many understand uh, the, the most expensive new car you could buy? You drive it off the showroom floor, it's, it's aging, right? It's a matter of time. Whether it's five years, 10 years, or 50 years, whatever it is, it's headed downhill. The house, as soon as you got it built, it's aging. And I realize things can last for decades and we can get good use out of it for decades. But how many think you ought not be overly attached to something that's about to be ashes? What should we be focused on? What should be the thing important to us? What will last? What will remain forever? Jesus said this. Jesus said in John 4.34, he said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The Amplified says it like that. My food, my nourishment is to do the will, the pleasure of him who sent me and to accomplish and completely finish his work. What satisfied him? What fulfilled him? Doing the Father's will and completing the assignments and directives the Father gave him. He said, that's what fills me up. That's what satisfies me. That's what nourishes me. And that's what nourishes all of us. That's why you can get the car you always wanted. You can get the house you always wanted. And yes, maybe it's nice. Maybe you can enjoy some things about it. But as time goes on, it cannot fill that place inside you. It can't. Because it's just a thing. It can't. You can't get enough cars 
enough houses, enough jewelry, enough clothes. You can't, you can't get enough of it to fulfill you inside. Impossible. Do you believe it or not, saints? That's why there's some very, very wealthy people that are some very miserable people. Because at least the poor guy can imagine that if he ever got it, he'd be happy. <laughs> but the rich man or woman, they got it all and then some, and they know they're not happy. What do they got to look forward to? They've done it all. They've seen it all. They've tried it all. And they're still miserable. In fact, they're more miserable now than before. Well, it's because it never was intended to fulfill you inside. It can't. It can't. What will fulfill you? Jesus said, this is what satisfies me. Doing the will of him who sent me and accomplishing and completely finishing his work. Can you say me too? Me too. Jesus said in John 8, 29, I do always those things that please him. And was he even though he became poor for us, you know, at the end, they took the very clothes right off of him. He became poor. He left heaven. He was born in a cow stall, right? For the king of kings, living in the glory and splendor of the presence of the Almighty, oh, that's, that's a step down. We have no idea. But he did it so we could be abundantly supplied, so we could be rich. He took our place. He became poor. So we could be rich. Now, go with me to, to Luke, please. You got a little bit more time? Or? Yeah. We've had to lay a foundation some more on some of these things. Uh, perhaps we and haven't talked about it as much as we could have or should have. Do you know one of the, the shouting things about what we're talking about right now? You get this right, and you qualify for the surplus. Come on, can you see this, saints? You, you, and, and there can be some answers as to why some things have not been forthcoming, why some things hadn't happened. It can be some adjustments need to be made in these areas. In fact, I didn't tell you the rest of that story. Uh, we, we, Phyllis and I were tight, really tight in our finances during that time. And uh, the Lord actually, and seeking him and praying for some length of time about this, he helped me to see. He said, well, son, you should have thought about putting me first before you committed yourself to those big car payments and that house payment and all these other things. He said, you should have, you should have settled that first before you did those things. He said, you, you didn't put me first. And so now, you know, he talks to you the way you understand. Now you're in a bind. And, and he said, son, I, talking about that new car. He said, I don't care if you have five of those. Be great with me. But that's not where you are right now. And your priorities have not been right. You, you, you and Phyllis, your giving is not where it needs to be. Your priority is not, this is taking too much. You can't commit yourself and obligate to all, all these things and then go, wow, I don't have anything to give. Well, why didn't you think about that before you did all that? There's a reason why people don't have to give. Their priorities are wrong. What does Matthew 6, 33 say? Seek ye what? First. So uh, I sold that car. I'd only had it for three months. I sold that car. As you might imagine, took a bath on it. That means lost money. You don't drive a new car off the showroom floor like that and put, you know, 3,000 miles on it and sell it in three months. You're going to lose money, usually. And I did. But I knew I had to. I had to. We sold other things. We liquidated other things. And we put our faith on paying things off. Why? We got to get our priorities right. And we committed to tithing. Not playing with tithing. Tithing. And, we, and, and to be good partners with the ministries that God had called us to. We started off being partners with people for, what was our first amount, Phil? Five? Twenty-five. Yeah, 25 is what I was going to say. $25 with the, one of the main ministries the Lord had dealt with us a month. And that might not sound like much now, but it was to us then. But we got that 25 there every month like clockwork. And I kept telling myself as I saw that shiny car go away, I thought, hey, 
I'll get three of them later <laughs> if, I, if I want to, but I got to get my priorities right. Is anybody listening? Anybody with me? My priorities have to be right. First things got to be first. And I was trying to act like I was at a place I wasn't there yet. It's quiet in here. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. (laughs) Your thing's between you and the Lord. And uh, the Lord had given us a car. It's Phyllis's car. And so she allowed me to ride with her for, it was almost two years, wasn't it? A year and a half or something. She was very gracious, allowed me to ride with her. And uh, oftentimes those, you know, she hadn't got off work yet, so I had to wait. And so I had to practice my patience. That was good for me too. Come on, are you listening, saints? And you really, I had had a car actually since I was 12 years old. My dad got me a four-door 63 Impala that I only drove on the farm. <laughs> Country folks do that, you know. Of course, you've been driving a tractor since you could see over the steering wheel. So, And, and, and so I would had my own car most of my life. And now to not have it, I, you know what I found out? It meant too much to me. Are y'all with me or not? I found out it had been too big of a part of my life. I needed to die to it. Hmm? I needed to die to it. Now later on, years later, I was able to enjoy some of the same things, but they don't mean much to me. Not like they did then. Man, I I can give it away just like that tomorrow. Whatever the Lord tells me, I can let it go. It's not my baby. And I don't love it. I love God. I love people. I don't love things. It'd help you just to change your talk. Don't don't use the word love relative to things. It'll help you. I don't love a house. I don't love a piece of jewelry. I don't love. I know we use that. Somebody said, what's wrong with saying that? I'm telling you what's wrong with it if you listen. Get these things out of your heart and it can start with your mouth. It'll help you just to, uh, for, for one thing, that, that car is never loving you back, <laughs> ever. <laughs> Those earrings will never love you back. <laughs> I just love them. You shouldn't. You can enjoy them. Hmm? You can use them. But... You're just passing through, and so are they. And if the Lord deals with you to sow them to somebody or, or sell them and do, put the money in the gospel or do something, it, you are not to even cry one tear over it, or you are not to miss a step. Yeah. You are to go, no problem. Yeah. It's worth more as a seed anyway. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's always worth more as a seed when the Lord's in it. Yeah. <laughs> Whew, I'm having a time getting to, getting to my stuff today. Keep taking all these side journeys. Where are you? You need to be in Luke. That's good. You got time for Luke? I'm I'm not done. I don't. When I say me, I'm I'm talking about you too. We're in this together, you know. I can almost hear somebody said, "But I love my. I know. I know. (laughs) But it hurts. I know. Go ahead and kill it. Kill it." Put it out of its misery. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to qualify? Huh? For the life abundant. For surplusage. Yes. 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 Then your heart has to be right. Your motives have to be right. Your priorities have to be right. First things first. And these things have got to be way down the list. Not at the top. In the, in the Old Testament, do you remember? You're, you're, you're standing by at Luke. Did you even know what chapter to go to in Luke? I didn't tell you. Chapter 12. Chapter 12. But while you're turning there, let me give you uh, Exodus 18.21. Don't turn to Exodus. but ex- uh, No, uh, uh, I told you wrong. Exodus 18, 17. 
18.17. That's not right either. Excuse me. Uh, try Deuteronomy 5.21. Deuteronomy 5.21, which is a repeat of the Exodus, Exodus passage. He says, neither shall you desire your neighbor's wife, neither shall you covet your neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now the word desire means to delight in. And the word covet means to wish or long for. Is it okay to delight in what somebody else has? No. No. Don't let yourself do it. Is it okay to long for what somebody else has? It is not okay. And don't let the enemy deceive you and say, well, maybe God's dealing with them to give it to me. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's theirs. Hmm? And as long as it's theirs... It's theirs and you must not let yourself long after it or think about it. If you do, you're yielding to evil. Did you hear me, saints? It's theirs. And what, you're just supposed to be happy that they're enjoying it. Glad they got it. Right? And believe God's big enough to get you yours. Right? The right way. Hmm? Here's a phrase uh, you might like. They make new ones every day. <laughs> and the new ones are improved. Generally. Don't let yourself long for theirs. In Luke 12 and 13. I'm thinking about getting ready to close. Luke 12 and 13. One of the company came to Jesus and said, Master. Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. He had an opportunity to speak to the master, to be in his presence. And this was the most pressing thing on his mind. <laughs> he said, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, what does he expect? I didn't say what you expect. What, what do you think he expects to happen next? He expects Jesus, maybe his brother was there in the crowd. I don't know. Or to send word and go, now you know you're supposed to divide fairly and equally with your brother. So, so div quit messing around and give your brother his part of the inheritance. And, he'd have went, he'd, and this man would have said, that's right. <laughs> Listen to Jesus. Because <laughs> it's only right and fair. And the main thing Jesus is always concerned about is what's right and fair. <laughs> Actually, no. He is righteousness in perfection. He is only just and fair. You know that. But you know what he looks at more than anything? Your heart. Did you know you can be technically right and yet be wrong in your heart? Did you know that? Even if the law was on this guy's side, even if his brother was just being a jerk, that doesn't make what he's doing okay because he's obsessing over this. And he's let this, let this, this is making him, you can see it, it's, this is making him bitter. And of all the things he could talk to the master about, this is the biggest thing on his mind. Hmm? It's not the meetings, it's not the message, it's not the miracles, it's not the people coming in, it's my money. My stuff. That was mama's thing and she always promised that I'd have that. Daddy told me. Y'all divide that right down the middle. You know he did. 
I have a right. Actually, your heart's all wrong. And you care way too much about the stuff. That little house, that little piece of land means way too much to you. That you fume about it. Day in, day out. Do everything but cuss and probably did that. Told everybody how sorry they were. Over what? Ashes. Everybody say ashes. ashes. Say that loud. Ashes. 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 <laughs> yeah, but it was going to be my ashes. It was <laughs> promised to me. Do you believe Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah. Would he tell you what he told this man? Yes. What did he tell him? Jesus said, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? That was not the answer he's looking for. He told you I was going to straighten out y'all's fight and quarrel. Read the next verse. Let these words sink down into your ears. He said, take heed. What does take heed mean? We don't usually use that terminology. What would we say today? Watch out. Watch out. If Jesus says watch out, what should you do? You better wake up and look. He said, watch out. Beware of covetousness. Did this man think he had a covetousness problem? No, he think he had a brother that wouldn't do right problem. <laughs> huh? He thought he had a problem with the will. A problem with the execution of the will. He had a legal problem. Hmm. He had heart problems. He's covetous. Yeah, but it belongs to me. That's not the only thing that matters. Yeah, but they promised me. Doesn't matter. That's no excuse for your heart being like that. It's no justification for being so bitter and resentful and covetous. What is covetousness? It's idolatry. It's like worshiping and praying to a statue. It's elevating something above God's place in your heart and mind and life. Because if you'd have gone, if this man would have gone to God, uh, from what we can see, what Jesus told him, if this man would have gone to God and prayed and said, "Father, what, what do I need to do about this?" Apparently, he'd have said, "You need to forget about it and trust me." And if he, and if what God said meant the most to him in the world, that'd have been the end of it. He could have saved himself so much frustration and legal bills. And ulcers in the stomach. Come on, are you listening? And migraine headaches. Are y'all listening or not, saints? I'm telling you. So many times the Lord would have told us, leave it alone. Let them have it. If you, if you don't think so, go back and read. One of the kings had spent millions of dollars, millions, to hire a supplemental army to help his in an upcoming conflict. And the Lord sent the man of God to him and said, if you take that bunch with you, I'm not going to be with you. <laughs> and he said, what about all my money? <laughs> and the man of God said, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. <laughs> That's his answer. The Lord, what does that mean? That means you lost that, buddy. You should have prayed <laughs> before you hired this bunch. Right? But it's not the end. And it doesn't mean you just lost it forever. What did the word of the Lord say? The Lord is able to give you much more than this. When Abraham and Lot, their, their people were in strife about their grazing lands. Abraham said, this can't be. This cannot, we cannot have strife between us. We're not going to have strife between us. What do you want? You tell me which way you want to go, I'll go the other way. And Lot picked the water in the desert. That's like gold, but more than gold. He picked all the springs and the waters. That's where the grass is. That's where you flux. And Abraham said, no problem. I'll go the other way. Didn't he? This is a godly man. Why? 
He's got faith. How can he do that? Because he doesn't, doesn't matter to him what anybody else does. He knows God's going to take care of him. He knows he's going to be all right no matter what anybody does or does not do. And you know, it wasn't just a short amount of time. God called him out and said, I want you to come out here with me. Look this away. Look that away. Look this away. I'm going to give you this whole thing. It's not the people that fight over the nickels and dimes of what's theirs that get the big blessings. It's the people that trust God and are willing to do about it what he said to do. Can you say amen? amen. Now, back to, uh, well, excuse me, the next verse. He said, who made you a judge or divider over, made me a judge or divider over you? He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. There has been, with people preaching prosperity, among some, there has, the focus has been primarily on just accumulating a lot of stuff personally and a lot of money and being comfortable. And that's not right. That's not the whole message. Are y'all listening to me, saints? Does God want us to have abundance? Yes. 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 Just so we can pile it up no. at our house. No. no. No, that's not right. Read, read, read the words of Jesus. Uh, th these will bear meditation. It'd be good to say these over to yourself scores of times. T tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Work this into your consciousness. Verse 15, say it out loud, say it with me. Take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. How much stuff you got does not tell you what kind of life you have. That is not your life. All of it's temporary, temporary. Now notice the next, the next verse, verse 16, and, so this goes with that, he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, where did he get this? Where did he get this? <laughs> he got this from his self. <laughs> he got a plan. Where did he get it from? <laughs> from his self. He said, what, should, what am I going to do? I got no room to bestow my fruits. I have had 30, 60, 100 fold harvest. And I got nowhere to put my stuff. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull down my barns and build greater. And there I'm going to bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. You are secure and you can retire. Take your ease, buddy. You earned it. Eat, drink, be merry, have a good time. Enjoy the latter years of your life. Let this world go by. You have some fun. <laughs> it's too quiet in here now. <laughs> I want, well, I need to keep reading. God said to him, That's real smart. <laughs> Thinking ahead, you. <laughs> no, what did he say? <laughs> he said, well, you, vows in italics. He just said, fool. Who's that Mr. T used to say that all the time? <laughs> 18. <Yeah>. Fool. <laughs> this night. Your soul's going to be required of you. When? Tonight. When? Tonight. And then whose shall those things be that you have piled up in your new barns that you've provided? Verse 21. 
so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Hmm? Skip down to verse 31. Ten verses later he says, but what? Rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Can you see that so many have not rightly divided the word on this subject? And it's no wonder because the enemy is working overtime to get people confused and to keep them out of this or to get them in one, in one error or the other. Either people, all they talk about is stuff and money and, and, and it sounds like that that's, that's the most important thing of being a Christian and if you don't have a lot, you're just not doing anything. Or there's people that say you ought not have anything and the closer to God, you got to get rid of all that junk. It's just a hindrance between you and God and, and, and God's perfect will works out for you to basically have nothing above your bare necessities. Both are wrong. Do you believe it, saints? Both of these are wrong. Where's the truth? What's the rightly divided truth? Notice the phrase. Notice the phrase. Verse 21. So is he, 21. So is he that lays up treasure for who? Just for himself. And is not rich toward God. The man was rich but he wasn't rich in God. The Bible differs between rich in the world and rich in God. You can be rich with stuff. There are people who have a lot of money, but they're still poor on the inside. They got good china. They will never use. They will never use it. They're saving it for when? When? <laughs> they, they got money they're saving it they're, they're, they're saving money on this and saving money on that for what I know of no rewards in heaven for the people that save the most money none do you know of anything like that hmm. no that doesn't mean you blow and waste everything but there's a difference between laying up just only for yourself and being rich toward God. When he began to see surplus, his only thought was keeping it for himself. Never occurred to him, I guess, that he could do something for somebody else. The problem was selfishness, self-centeredness, and things meaning too much to you. Listen, go back to uh, 16, and as we read the next couple of verses, notice everywhere it says, I or me or my. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself. And what did he say? What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? Then he said, this will I do I will build down my barns and build greater. There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease and eat and drink and be merry. He, he's completely oblivious to anything outside his little world. Everything is for me and mine and only me and mine. And he said, fool. You're not going to use all that. You're out of here tonight. <laughs> How many know it is, it is being a fool to act like you're going to be down here forever and make plans and try to act like you're going to live down forever? Everybody should know you're not. How many people still around from the 1700s? How many? How many? <laughs> exactly None. So the Lord tarries is coming another couple hundred years from now. How many of us will be around? Nine. How many? 
How many? None. Exactly none. Not a one. Is God a good God? Yes, he is. Is he a God of abundance and prosperity? Yes, he is. But abundance for what? To pile up for yourself? No, it's got to be more to it than that. Are y'all with me, saints? It's abundance far beyond what you need and what it takes to run you and yours. When you get abundance and surplus, you don't just think, I need a bigger barn. You think, I got to sow. I got to give. I can help somebody else now. I can do more than I've done before. Is that right, saints? Yeah. And you begin to flow above and beyond over yourself. And when you get caught up in this, you begin to be not just a reservoir. You're not all dammed up and shut up. You begin to be a conduit. You begin to be one that God can flow through. And if he can trust you with little, he can trust you with much. And he will increase it and increase it until large quantities are flowing through you into the kingdom, into other people, helping people, meeting needs. Do you desire this, saints? Are you hungry for this? It won't just fall on you. You have to thirst and hunger and reach for it and believe for it and go for it. Are y'all with me, saints? But you know, one of, the, one of the great things about being a big pipe that's flowing huge amounts through that pipe is always full. <laughs> it's flowing in, it's flowing out, but it works out that that section is always full too. And so your needs are always met. And God does give you things, even things to enjoy and things that you do take pleasure in, but they are not your God and they're not an idol to you and you're not stuck on any of it and you don't love any of it. It's easy come. Easy go, easy receive, easy flow. What do you think, saints? Do you believe the Lord's telling us all these things for a reason? What would be the reason he would be talking to us about these things? Because not everybody will believe this. Not everybody will obey him. Not everybody will do this. Would you say, I will? Stand on your feet and